Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Second, we will then have our speaker who will speak. The third part is a question and answer period. And it's for questions and the questions only. Please do not uh, make statements during that question period. The last bit will be the rebuttal period where you will be able to spout off generally up to five minutes after the speaker. At the end, the speaker gets the last word. Two rules of the College of Complexes. One is no, one is uh, one fool at a time. Second is no personal attacks. Tonight we do have a speaker. His name is Peter Perro. He's going to be talking about China. I would read the uh, formal thing from the schedule, but I do know that we all know Peter very well. So what I'm going to do is we're going to get him set up right away. Uh, on, on. And uh, let's welcome Peter Perro. Uh, you may not applaud. Uh, when we're finished with this, you may think, oh, I'm getting out of here. Uh, Boiled. What led me? What brought me to China was to see 27 years later how it developed. Just the first time I, I attended, I, I took a group tour, was 1993. And uh, we're coming on 27 years now. It was quite an eye opener to see the changes from communist society to very much a socialist, if not communist anymore. And and we'll see those visions of the the walkthrough and some of the things that caught my eye. Uh, I leave this map as our starter. And we can see some of the areas that border China that are getting treated to Belt and Road. How many know what that is? The Belt and Road Plan, wow, you read a lot, is a rail and highway development to China's neighbors, to China's neighbors in Kazakhstan, which makes the Russians jealous, but makes China rich because they have another resource and a friendly neighbor. I'll talk about that in a moment and how China has changed. What I want to do is show you pictures from the road. Then I want to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly uh, of China now. What, what's improved and what in my mind and opinion and from reading and talking to the people of uh, what has not improved and what's still a problem. Uh, of course, we'd start at something like a tourist place like uh, the Great Wall and uh, they did take us on a bus to that, and everything was by bus primarily. But once the group left, I stayed two more weeks and was totally on my own to take tours anywhere I please. I mean, not to military installations, but people have the conception that you got to stay on the bus or go back home. But no, you're free to wander, and I did. Um, I want to say that this could be older than the Great Wall, we were told. And uh, it's uh, a stone, it's made from stone, it's not porcelain, but it's one of the earliest tea services that I saw in the People's Museum. Now, this is far different, but also knocked me off my seat when I, when I realized this is one of the uh, $7,000 toilet projects that they're showing off in the best hotels. Uh, I had to get a shot of it and uh, the old crane plumbing factory here in Chicago was part and parcel to supplying the hand grips and some of the pieces. Uh, yes. Well, this is a first class hotel and this is what you'll find now in China that I didn't find in 1993. The Kohler fixtures and some of the things that we've exported. Yeah, I use the word exported to China. But also we stayed in hostels, which are not just for youth, but uh, adults can use the hostel. And since mo most of the people on the bus were educators in this tour group, 
most of them could not afford the more wealthy hotels, the tourist at, uh, flagship hotels. So we ended up many, in many cases in these hostels. This was a British fellow I, I met there. Uh, I still see vestiges of communist graphics occasionally, not like it was in 1993, whereas salute to the people and you know, Mao loves the people, this sort of thing. This is played down graphic art. Uh, I still saw photos of Mao here and there, but not as frequent. And of course, uh, Xi Peng is now our, uh, I won't say a great, what was a great leader, a great uh, commandeer. He had several nicknames, Mao Zedong. Great helmsman. Great helmsman, yes, leader of his people. Now it's Xi, Xi Ping with a uh, business suit on, and uh, very easy to think he appears on LaSalle Street or somewhere on Mad uh, Wall Street. So the garb has changed. There were no Mao jackets. I saw a lot of the blue jackets in 1993. Women had the blue or the navy blue suits on, pajama bottom type pants. And men had the green army khaki uniforms. Uh, and these are some some examples with the uh, the model cap, but there's not much of this anymore, and it's played down now to more civic duties, like please pick up your trash, or do not defecate in the streets, <laughs> things for making good citizens, and uh, promoting citizenship and civics. <coughs> this was a uh, construction construction sign, not, not a military sign or, or uh, uh, slogan. Oh, got a little problem with that, but this is, this is for littering, and it says, separate your trash. Uh, I can give you that translation anyway, that cans and bottles in the green and paper, plastic in the red. Uh, she's giving her son that lesson here through example. Oh, got to go back, Tim, and I don't know where that, uh... You didn't ask for one. You said you weren't ready. That icon, it's hard to see from here, so I have to, uh... Ask for it. Let's go back a step. Think. What did you press? Next? In case I get the... Previous. Previous. Makes sense. I, I was surprised to see this cartoon, uh in a magazine there, and it's the Chinese wall around the United States was the, the propaganda part. Well, of course, there was no Chinese wall around the United States except for the Know Nothing Party or Anglo-Americans who were opposed to the Chinese at this stage in the uh, 1890s. Uh, up through the laying of the tracks in California, the Golden Spike, all of that kind of thing that brought Chinese labor to California and the West. Uh, he's kicking the ladder down on Chinese that supposedly are trying to come over the wall. So it's one of those Hearst or Condé Nast or uh, Nast cartoons that were uh, instilling anger and uh, frustration and uh, hostility toward our Chinese immigrants. Now here, here we go again. We need the preview, right? What's that? Maybe Mozart. You want the flipper. Yeah, well, too late. What you need to do, go back one? Uh, yeah, baby, baby Mozart here. Get preview. You're not going to be able to flip it. Yeah, it's got to be flipped. We can't. No, can't do that. Just, I'll go to baby Mozart. This is a lot of, uh, yeah, Charlie lives in the uh, immigrant area right now. Um, Bridgeport's taking a, a great infusion of investors for real estate property in Bridgeport. And all the way west to McKinley Park, I should add, right now. So there's a lot of upheaval in uh, South Chicago or Southwest Chicago, Bridgeport area, Canaryville, some of those little towns that were, or little neighborhoods that were mostly white 30 years ago, and Irish. Um, maybe Mozart, maybe Mozart was uh, a real shock to me to see in the store window 
these baby grand pianos. And I asked someone, well, is this going to be uh, for a symphony or adult performance? No, those are for children now. We in China believe the children need to be encouraged to study the fine arts. And uh, there's a lot of uh, promotion about Western music, Western art, and for children to get that sort of exposure early. And many middle class Chinese have the money. So we see this, and it really knocked me, knocked me over. I saw it in a shopping mall, and uh, there were quite a few people in the, in the store at that point. Had to try the bullet train. And a bullet train will do about 225 kilometers, and there's a nice sort of speedometer in each car, so you can see the marvels of uh, bullet transit as you sit and read your newspaper. And it, it was hitting close to 200, 200 kilometers, or uh, I would say about 175 miles per hour on that bullet train. Um, so you can move from the countryside to the city rapidly in the three hubs that are Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Beijing. So here's one coming in to stop, and I was hanging on to my backpack, uh, a little bit afraid of the velocity. Uh, visited a Koban, I had a peek in a police station, because I had heard that China spends more on domestic surveillance right now than it does on its own international expenses or budget. So China is very, very uh, paranoid about things that could be going on internally. And I think this, this skirmish with Hong Kong uh, last month, and still continuing, uh, is evidence of the, the paranoid attitude of the, the party about domestic affairs. Uh, of course, I didn't talk to the police because none of them spoke English and my Mandarin was only good enough to order food, so. Uh, looking at religion, can't, can't be in China without looking at religion, and Buddhism is still the major religion. Uh, got to see, and I'm sorry it's flipped here, a uh, shrine of, of the Buddha. And uh, this is, uh, the English is a little rough, but in Chinese it's stating that the longest, the longest in use uh, writing tool in, in human history is the bamboo, bamboo scroll. Uh, the Chinese claim that, so I suppose this is a piece of propaganda. Maybe it's more cultural today, this propaganda, than it used to be praise of Mao or praise of Cho and Lai in the 70s. Uh, let's look at food as long as you're looking at your plates. And uh, this is uh, duck's feet. And everyone was telling me, you got to try the duck, you got to try the duck's feet. And I said, no, I don't, no, no thanks. But I did try the chicken. Oh no, the pork I didn't try either, but here it was in a supermarket and I I just had to take that picture, the cloved hoof, uh, and, and, and broke at the joint, those three, three pig, pig rolls here. Here were chicken, chicken steamed, chicken feet, I mean every part of the chicken, nothing goes to waste. And chicken roasted, or roasted. And I did try those chicken feet. Uh, not to me, not, not to my delicacy. I, I really favored the chicken that Heather put on the plate tonight. I'd rather. But it's a delicacy and to them. They feel it's high, high living or middle class living to have that on your table. Uh, and, and, and beef. Beef is quite, quite a delicacy. Uh, those duck, duck pieces that we saw first in the first slide of the meats are, are looking like this once the duck is roasted. And it is very tasty when it's roasted. And a lazy Susan here turns the vegetables around for all that had duck and want to add condiments and things to it. 
Uh, this was a Middle Eastern couple that was on the tour, and gee, I can even get the the arrow to to move on this. Thank you, Tim. Tim put up with a lot of uh, technical difficulties tonight, to say the least, and he he really whipped us together in less than a half hour. So, uh, steam a steamer at the table, and I have to say that the steam is drawn from under the table up a flue and it made me think oh is this table cloth going to burn or are my pant legs going to fall fall in, uh, into fire uh, but it didn't and apparently it's safe and so the flue from under the table heated the uh, stew and everyone draws stew pieces using chopsticks you might say well that's unsanitary but that's an Asian tradition to share the bowl with the sticks, everyone at the table. Share the noodle bowl, share the meat bowl, just share this uh, stew. Some other unusual ones, not here unusual, but I didn't expect Oreo cookie, green tea, ice cream. I thought that's something I'd get here at Baskin Robbins or someplace in the loop. And it was on the menu at the Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, it was really Dunkin' Donuts, another American export. So I'm going to talk about that export-import tariff idea tonight. Uh, rice balls, or rice, sweet rice balls, made by hand. I thought it was terrific, and that was a dessert with the duck. Yeah, stick to the, stick to the U.S. brand, Iowa beef. Uh, now this was a food delivery truck, and I have to say, take delivery in that was quite a trip in that you you take the order fill the steamer and take it to a an office downtown Shanghai run the stuff upstairs or if you're fortunate enough to have an elevator to run it up the elevator bring it for delivery and and to my surprise this has been going on a long time in Korea Japan and China to my surprise guess who's doing it now in the US um, chain store we all know well. Domino's. No, well, you're right. Domino's puts pizza on a, on a, on a rack, but that's, that's a $10, $20 affair. I'm seeing McDonald's doing this now for a $3 hamburger. And, and of course, they're going to take several orders in the back trunk of the motorcycle. So it's worth their while to do this kind of transaction. But I'm thinking, geez, bring a $3 hamburger to your home with fries in a high rise in the South Loop. They'll do it. So we are ingenuity, uh, full of uh, ingenuity. I, I, I want to praise uh, some American ingenuity there. Uh, geez, I wish I could turn the whole screen around for you. But in Japan, I once saw the 100 yen store. And I thought, now what is this? It looked very much like Dollar Tree down, down, the, down in the mall here, or Family Dollar with all those small items in the uh, stores. So that's what the 100 yen was for. Well, I saw the 10 won store. Well, you do the math, 10 won's equal to roughly what a, what a, a middle class family can afford on a lark. You know, I'll take these scissors or these batteries or buy some sunglasses. So they've got the concept of the dollar store embedded there in China. So I bought a few little things like Cheap souvenirs when you think of uh, chopsticks for 50 cents, the equivalent of 50 cents, uh, and so on. Little things like that, teacups. Fill the suitcase. Uh, one thing that was high end in the hotel was jade. And this fellow has a mask, and I, I didn't include he ought to be wearing an eye, eye guard to. Uh, drill, uh, drill uh, etchings into the uh, jade, but it creates a smoke and you don't want to be breathing it either. He was uh, quite an entrepreneur to be doing that, maybe a little foolish without high, high gear. Uh, I saw advertisements, I'm seeing more, and uh, China's seeing more of it too, clutter and ads. This one was for soap, from the jade soap company of China and it was on a bus it's an old graphic that they had copied 
JT? No, JT is flavored. It's a ice cream? Yeah, another American export, Mr. Softy. To my surprise, I don't see it much. And there it was in the park. Kids were grouped around it. Mommy, give me, give me the sundae. I want that popsicle. In Chinese, I said he can Mandarin. So Mr. Softy made it big in middle-class China. Uh, the guide on our bus. And one of the uh, fellows that was on the bus, Greg, was from Wisconsin. And she is our guide. Took us to the restaurants. Until we said goodbye to the bus and the guide, and then I was on my own uh, to eat what the local people could eat in, din in sort of diners and ramen kitchens. Uh, here's just a couple closing shots on uh, pagodas. And on a Sunday, these are packed with families. Uh, Man-made pools here. Very picturesque. Reminded me of a Pearl Buck novel that I read in sixth grade. Uh, and uh, a shopping mall that was put into a pagoda. Three floors of stores. There was no end to it. It was like uh, River West, I, I have to think. And that was not, there was nothing like that in the 90s. And finally, uh, with stone, you can make a likeness of mountains. So this was carved from stone. And it's a common park picture to see uh, mountains carved out of, uh, well, not jade, but uh, easy to get stone. And this child was searching for Ko, K-O-H, for Ko in the water on a Sunday, and his parents were saying, get out of the water, you know, don't fall in the water, and I could see he was being scolded anyway. And I used that as the last shot. So, we're back to Mount Chairman Mount. Uh, You've got a, you want to, are you done with the slideshow? I'm done with the slides, so we can shut that up. Okay. That, that's fine. Now, you're, what are you going to do next, Peter? Your well, flip chart? I've got problems and advantages for China. And I wanted to talk about both sides of the story. But I'd like to ask you to uh, write something on a card that will take a moment. Bear with me, Tim. All right. Card, card. Someone move my card. Who moved my cheese? There they are. Reminds me of the book. Who moved my cheese? I'd like you guys to, and women, to collaborate and talk about something you'd hold in common. That would be what the group agrees on as the best form of mass transit for the U.S. I talked about mass transit and the bullet train in China, oh, you got one? also Japan. We're going to need a note taker. I've always got a pen. Don't I get a car? I'd like to. Go back to train, or you might say improve our highways, or you might say buses for everyone, small towns and suburbs. Second thing, yeah. All right. What are your recommendations at your table for mass transit in the U.S.? As long as I was on that subject. Right. I 
Okay, Peter, um, let's keep going. You can, you can take the mic off the stand. That's a good idea. Just unwrap it and hold it in your hand. All right, save time for second point. Try to agree back there. It's hard for collegiates to agree, I know. Okay, so what are we looking for? The best, best transit price. solution for the U.S. Okay. Second, density. How to spread our population in the U.S.A. and make our cities less crowded. And idea for industrial competition. How can America be better at what we make and export? And you may say give up on give up on steel and aluminum and stick to high tech or whatever solution. Right now we're arguing about st steel and aluminum tariffs, not just with China, but Brazil and other unfree traders, Trump would say. He wants fair trade and he argues that we're not getting a fair shake in global markets. Well, Chinese are saying that too, that our tariffs are killing them. How do we make American trade more productive. So it's these three things. Mass transit, density, and industrial trade and production policy, correct? That's right. That's All right. right. Now, are you going to give us a few minutes to discuss it, or are we going to get a chance to... Uh, Not to shout it out, but to get it on a card. Give me three ideas on a card that you can all agree on, generally speaking. So what would you do about Let's see that chart again, Peter. Oh, you want to put it on? Density. What to do about density? What to do about trade? Yeah. All right. Everybody knows. Leave that up. Leave that up on the hook. Yeah. Time when these people learn the language. I like the way we got it. Radical principle back to Adam's. Behind the mic, Pete. Yeah, uh, he's the one who wrote the Wealth of Nations back in 1776. He was the guy who was basically saying that each and every country should specialize in its own goods and trade with each other tariff free so that we could. Uh, Basically, move on. And we don't need a lot of stuff. We just need to be better at what we're good at doing, which is high tech. Some of the other places might be better off with the steel and aluminum in the trade. And it's not a matter of how much of a trade deficit or balance there is. As long as you're trading back and forth and creating open markets, you're going to be much better off. People groups. I'm going to take those cards. All right. And so you're collecting the cards. See if you agree with each other. Uh, 
Mass transit was bus. All right. Well, we got a limited, we got a uh, industrial trade production. No, that's not only that, but the crucial thing here in Chicago is uh, are you going to have more buses? Or are you also going to have uh, when it gets light rail, maybe? rapid transit? Uh, you need the rapid kind of transit. Thing. The fastest way to get transit right, going nationwide would be bus. I'm going to get this uh, Tim Bolger gavel. All right. The Tim Bolger gavel. Of order. Order. Yeah. Your eggs. Order, order. All right. We got another card here, Peter, for you. Peter. Okay. I'm not sure, boy, the penmanship in here is definitely DF material, but... Uh, Free and fair trade. What do you what do you say? Oh, free and fair. Free and fair trade. No answer? No answer to number two on density. Free and fair trade for number three. And back to trains, of course, for number one. Charlie, you'll be glad to hear that. Let's hear the others. Here's one who roots for the bus. Revitalization of our urban areas. Let's hear it for that. Glory Lightfoot. And at, stick to Adam Smith. 1776, Adam Smith, the wealth of nations. Uh, basic. I knew you'd basically, come up with basically saying that uh, we need to trade. We need to be. We need to trade with what we're good at and trade with other nations what they're good at, and everybody benefits. So you want to go back in time, right, Tim? Not back in time. Just, it's called globalization. Yeah. It's called globalization, and it's been working for a number of years. All right, Adam Smith, 1776. The wealth of nations. Uh, the wealth of nations. Yes. And he talked about an invisible hand that guides the marketplace. Yes. And China somehow is very interested in that right now. Yeah, it's sweatshops yeah. too. And sweatshops too, Charlie. Another essential step for, for, for production and industrialization. Oh boy, I can hear the rebuttal coming over. <laughs> Uh, Another card here, Charles. Somebody uh, says something about trains. 500 mile? What did you mean? 500 mile on train? I don't know who said that. Short distances, trains are good. Longer distances, you want to fly. Fly? Oh. Longer distances. All right. Better bus lines and flight. Population density. It'll work itself out. Oh. All right. It'll work itself out. I think we have smaller families going on right now. The trend seems to be, what, 1.5 children per family if it averages out. And uh, China right recognizes that they made a mistake with the one-child family, and that they very much, because they are an aging population much like Japan, and who's going to take over the next generation? So my answer to that is try immigration, but China is afraid of that. Maybe Tibet, maybe Mongolia, that's as far as they want to immigra see immigrants from. Yes? Did I do my own? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Take yours. Um, got a great group leader here. At our, at our table, we had only two people who were participating, and we had, like, opposite ideas. So I'm going to give two for each one. Um, the first one is my colleague here, David Travis. And he says, uh, suspend transit on an air cushion. So he's looking forward to a future when all travel would be uh, uh, suspended on air instead of rolling down the road. And that goes for, that goes for, uh, yeah, And my idea, uh, my idea was to stop building roads keep the ones we've got repaired and stop building roads because the more roads you build, the more cars you sell and the roads just become crowded immediately. Mm -hmm. So that was the first one. I think Good China's idea. going to find that out in a decade, in a decade, less than a decade. And uh, his idea about density was to put immigrants in special villages until they integrate and then they can leave their villages and 
come into the country to the regular like places in the country. Uh, Concentration camps, huh? Sounds like a camp. But well, he was, he was using uh, Israel's uh, kibbutz system oh, the as kibbutz. an example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think the problem, one problem that could be solved with some concentration is fast track to language, fast track to Mandarin language, which is a, na uh, a, a linguistic or a language that unites the country, Mandarin. Mandarin could be looked on as British English here, or uh, the English of Adam Smith in, in those times. The and thou and the Shakespearean uh, English, we could say. Okay, uh, and my, my so. idea about density was to uh, build walkable neighborhoods. Walkable neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. and that would help solve the density problem. And then about uh, the industrial trade and what was it? Production. Production. Uh, David's idea was no punitive taxes, and I just didn't have any ideas. Well, a little village idea, a little camp. So it takes a village. Uh, well, I got to say, uh, I've got to say that I brought one import I was anxious to have and, and wear, and I haven't worn it since the trip, but it's this Obama Mao t-shirt, maybe Tim can get a tighter look at it for posterity. But Obama, Obama was Kenyan. Obama. Sure, he's Kenyan, but of course this is a caricature. Obama. When he was running. Turn it towards the camera, Peter. Yeah. There you go. All right. We got it. Well, it was in a sort of a dollar store reference. You know, what do you get in a dollar store? You get Disney things and you get funny, funny t shirts for kids. So they were taking it not seriously that Obama's a communist, but they thought it was funny to see a cap on him, and I bought it. Less than ten dollars. Oh. Suspend transit through air air cushion. Stop building asphalt roads. Number two, put immigrants. Oh, we talked about the village. And no punitive taxes. Village, not camp. No punitive taxes. Now, interesting, in China there is no sales tax. I did not see any sales tax at the checkout, but there was a heavy wage tax. I'm not sure which uh, is better. I think wage tax is punitive and mandatory. You can't avoid it in the U.S. And uh, sales tax is discretionary. If you want to buy the thing, then you've got to afford the tax. So I think that uh, maybe the Chinese way of a sales tax, uh, wage tax, is maybe a better system than the 10% sales tax we've got now, 10.5, 10 10.9, 10 whatever. A wage tax. Much more under. What is we've got both. Yeah. We've got both. Is it wage tax, you're referring to withholding, right? Withholding, I should use that word. At 15 to top, top bracket is 33%. And I've got a lot to say on that, but I'll save that for another college of complex. Here it says we're Second Amendment fans here. We like bullets on a train. Not the bullet train. Bullets on a train. I, I, I'm going to duck. Seriously, though, try Liz Warren's plan, he says. So this is tongue-in-cheek, or maybe very, very serious. The last card says use a maglev. Magnetic elevation, well, use maglev yeah. or autonomous cars, self-driven, if you must do cars at all. And I think China's going to learn very quickly that the status of having a car is also the pain of trying to drive it in clogged highways in uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and in Beijing. Yeah. See you guys. Enjoy. Yep. Bye now. Well, let me, let me go through my uh, pro problematic views of China. Or should I start with the bright future? No problem in that bright future. Bright future. Tim Bolter is looking up and he's saying that... Uh, Problems first. They've got nothing to hide but, uh, well, capitalism. Bright future. Guaranteed government health care. A bright step, I felt, when I talked to people there 
about public clinics and public hospitals. Efficient mass transit in relation to U.S. trains, anyway, 17,000 miles of track on the bullet train. Really admirable what they could do in 20 years. Advanced robotic research, advanced medical tech research. And I'll say not without some U.S. help, because after all those future scientists of tomorrow in China, chances are got their degree at Champaign-Urbana, uh, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, and don't we benefit from it, of Don't course. forget the University of Pittsburgh. Oh, Pitt, that's my hometown. Yeah, great. Nittany Lions, go. Go, Nittany. Carnegie Church. And Carnegie Mellon. A huge uh, research and uh, science-oriented university. Uh, big agriculture. They're starting to make their own tractors and relying less on Caterpillar here and John Deere. They're starting to make their own. And this has us worried in the U.S. because a big uh, export of ours is farm implements. Farm implements in uh, Peoria and made near Peoria, John Deere and Cat. Uh, better quality goods. It used to be toys and trinkets, right? You remember? Plastic toys and trinkets and cheap t-shirts as they entered the textile sector. Now it's barely, it's that U.S. can barely make a decent suit. Gone. Hard Schaffner and Marx. Gone. Many footwear companies like uh, Forsheim was downtown in Chicago's Loop on Canal Street. Uh, so was uh, Hart Schaffner and Marx. Was in Chicago for many years. So we're seeing better quality goods. Charlie, what was that remark? Hart Schaffner and Marx are two guys. Two guys? It's not the, uh, you. Oh, yeah, no, it's Hart Marx. Yeah, I think it is made partially in Texas now. Uh, so there is some heart, heart suits left on the racks today. It's now called Heart and Mark. Uh, what else? Belt and Road. And you already know about Belt and Road. It's very, very interesting. And I thought, wait a minute, we did, didn't U.S. do something like that? Well, yes. It was called, it was... Uh, it was called, and I, I had something on it here. Ah, the World Bank, after all. Bretton Woods. World, Breton Woods Agreement. World Bank. Uh, I am out. World Trade. Uh, World, World Trade Organization. That loans money to underdeveloped countries, but it mainly comes through large banks. Remember, through all of this tonight, when I talk about economics, they are state pump prime economics, state economics. Ten key areas the government endorses and funds in China. And those are areas to be Western productivity. Uh, I want to say semiconductors. I want to say dram chips. These kinds of things, robots. And these kinds of things, yeah, it's, it's true, uh, are underwritten by government. Uh, 70 countries, though, are now benefited by China's Belt and Road Initiative to build trains and highways. Would you explain what the Belt and Road Initiative is? Yeah, I did, and some of you know already. Building transit to countries that have no water outlets of their own. And what do you do? You build uh, train travel, transit, from the interior of, say, Africa or Middle East to uh, the sea for export and for trading with the mother country being China. Countries like Belarus, countries like Pakistan, China is behind their textile industry. Countries in east of Africa, a very poor, struggling countries. Uh, Cambodia. Building rail and highway, funded by China, but there's a catch to it. What if you default on that loan? 
If you default, you've got the wrath of the Chinese government on your back. If you default and the U.S. owns it, well, Bank of America has made a bad loan. Chase is, has made a bad loan. Uh, and some lenders go, go out of business by making too many of those kinds of things. It happened in the 80s with big loans to Argentina, big loans to Chile. And when those loans to Brazil and so on went belly up, the banks suffered, not the U.S. government. But when you default to China, watch out, because it's affected foreign relations. I guess I'm getting in the problem area a little bit too much here, because it is a brilliant scheme. And I will say that the U.S. used it as far back as the 60s. Remember Alliance for Progress under John Kennedy? He was going to rebuild infrastructure in South America and Latin America through roads and rail, and it was called Alliance for Progress. Well, Progress, too, was in those times to the advantage of the rail builders, the road builders. And it was a way of also harnessing those countries through debt. If you've read the book, if you've read the book uh, Confessions of a Corporate Hitman, it goes into those kinds of things. It's a real, really powerful book, and there's a part two out now on Confessions of a Corporate Hitman. And the idea is to lock up other countries in high loan debt, whether it's through a nation and state government in China, or whether it's through uh, European and uh, US banks. Uh, I will give them credit for soft power. And by soft power, it's putting their Confucian Institutes in, Chinese, in Chicago schools, in the high schools, China bankrolls language instruction in Mandarin. You might say, well, oh, very, very sneaky, very, very underhanded. Well, it's sort of colonialism, isn't it? I think it has to do with goodwill. I think it has to do with people-to-people -people agreement, people-to-people -people enhancement. So, the Confucius Institute operates in schools like um, uh, Whitney Young, uh, Walter Payton, some of those schools, and a few Catholic schools. Uh, Conf the Confucian Institute. Space development. Guess who's charging ahead on space? I haven't seen Mr. Trump offer any new space, initi space initiatives. China's on it. Uh, polar exploration. One area that's haven't, that hasn't been taken advantage of, China's on it. Uh, North Pole and South Pole exploration through submarine. And deep sea exploration. These are areas we haven't had time for in the US, and even the Soviet Union hasn't had much time for space exploration, deep sea, and polar exploration. So I give the Chinese credit for that, and for the Belt and Road Initiative. Laws and all. Uh, another area, STEM. STEM means science, yeah. technology, and uh, math in our schools. Engineering and math, yeah, STEM. Uh, China has patents second to the US right now in number. Annual patents for 2017, US still stayed ahead. China was second, and Japan was third. And I might add, with help from Urbana, MIT, University of Wisconsin, and Pittsburgh, thank you, we have uh, helped with that development. And not without cost. I'm not saying we've given the education away. It's uh, out-of-state rates, folks, and that's a big rate to pay. But the other conundrum is, who's paying the freight if you're a bright student in China, the state pays your freight for American tuition. It doesn't happen in the U.S. that the state, largely federal government, will pay your way as an undergraduate in an out-of-country university. Uh, the one-child policy, let me say, in environmental protection and in cutting density, our second question, China is ahead, or was ahead, with the one-child policy. But now our middle class want two and three children in China. And so the one-child policy is falling into this favor. Okay. Uh, 
Permits to live in a city. Now here's where our Second Amendment rights are crossed over. You need a permit to move from the country to the city. Could you imagine a permit for someone to move from Kankakee or downstate Cahokia to come to Chicago? That's one control we haven't implemented in the U.S. In China, you have that. You have to have that that sort of visa to move from a farm province to the city, or have a good reason like going to college, doing research. But just coming without a job and with no plan, China avoids it. China wants to make their cities less dense, and that was number two. I'd almost side with it, but I think it's against your personal right, rights and the uh, Second Amendment. But it's uh, somewhat of a good idea to cut density in third world countries and underdeveloped countries. So, let me go to a couple of those products. Yeah, save those comments for the uh, for the rebuttal. What do you think it is? Rubber wheel. A what? Rubber wheel. Bomberia. What's a bomber? Rubber, rubber wheel. Oh, a rubber wheel. I was amazed to see the future in a in a bike store, because most cars in China in the next five to ten years will be hard rubber wheels. How do you benefit from that? How do you benefit from that? No flat tires. No flat tires. <laughs> no trunk room taken up by a hard rubber wheel, or I should say a, or an inflatable tire. And uh, no need to pay a buck at a gas station to fill your, your tire. It's a great idea. It takes a long life and doesn't really run, it eventually runs out, but far uh, less in a far longer time until the tread wears much harder on a hard ride, rubber though. tire. Much harder ride, though. Yeah. Uh, could be a tough ride, yes. There's something to that. Ah, oh, there's a rebuttal. But take a look at it anyway. It's terrific. What about spring, having better springs in the car so the ride is okay? To make up for the hard rubber tire, Tim. Better springs and shocks. Good okay. idea. Does it get worn out on when you have... Uh, roads that um, are really on the surface that ways. tread wears but look how much it's got to wear yet yeah. on that bike tire for a child's bike yeah. an inch that takes a long time to wear down yes andy with heart without blown tires you know you want hard tire you get greater mileage much greater mileage uh, you know, so, so you're in favor of the hard rubber idea well if you're going to go for high mileage you know you cut down the use of energy you know, the hard tires will roll with less friction. Uh, I didn't know that. Probably Duryea and Ford and some of the in inventors of the automobile operated with some hard tires or tried it. But now we're stuck on this Goodyear and uh, Goodrich uh, treadmill. I thought it was a cute thing, and uh, I'd like to see someone bring out an auto tire. Probably China will bring out the auto tire and hard rubber and see how it flies. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to show a couple things to say we're not all behind. Yes, what's the comment? Well, you know, if you drive down a, a street in Chicago, you're going to go bumpity bumpity bump because the streets are not repaired. Oh, yeah. So if you keep your highways, you. that, that was my suggestion about transit. Keep your highways repaired. <laughs> Keep your highway was repaired right. and spare that pneumatic type. Spare that pneumatic type. A couple winners for our side, meaning U.S. productivity, point three, is Coca-Cola. Yeah, what a thing to export, but it sells big. Now this says cola, coca, whatever. It's a slim can. It's got some, uh, what are these called, Ad advisors? Ad like on the cigarette packs. Warnings. Warnings about Coca-Cola. But it, does, it did seem to outsell in better restaurants the uh, Chinese colas, Chinese soda pop. Yes, I found Snickers, and it's popular. It's called 9.99 there. 
and it's not nine the equivalent of nine U.S. dollars, but maybe one. Why is uh, it called nine? Why I don't know. I couldn't get that story from anyone. I bet I could find it on Google somehow. Another American product, right? Google. Uh, but here we've invaded their Snickers, Coca-Cola, uh, Oreo cookies. You saw in the tea room. And the last, the last thing I'm not proud of. American cigarettes. They're very keen on that, that the American tobacco is a better product than Chinese tobacco. So there it is all over, on streets, the butts, the packs, the box, crush proof, uh, all of that was all over. And a lot more smoking by mainly males in China, Korea, and in Japan. And, and J.P. Lorillard knows that, Reynolds Tobacco Company knows that. They took the hit on the lawsuit in the 80s on tobacco abuse. But those companies have no federal government telling them about warnings and, and uh, lawsuits in Asia. So we still make money that way. Uh, now for the bad news. All right. The bad news is mm, I finished the one child policy. Gee, that would be healthier, I think, one child policy. Uh, <laughs> average wages in China are about a third of the earning power that the U.S. still produces. And average GDP, or gross domestic product, is about a third of the U.S. Now, I know most of it in the U.S., much of it is being produced by robots. That's the bad news on our side. But we still are a very productive nation. Uh, China has been called the world's largest authoritarian country. After all, one party, come on, folks, one party. And last year, Mr. Xi was elected for life if he wants it. So the party congress made that decision, and all you could do is watch, the, watch it on TV if you were a Chinese citizen. Uh, civil liberties take a beating in China compared to U.S. civil liberties. Yes, they have a constitution. They do have a constitution. It's more of an organ for or tool for government to operate. But they do have a constitution. Uh, loads of consumption just falling all over themselves to get foreign products, foreign fashion, candies, chocolates, liqueur. I saw a lot of that being consumed, but very little political revolution. What happened to that? What happened to Mao's dictums under the rug? I would say, and Stansfield Smith said so uh, here about three months ago, that China definitely is a socialist state but it is no longer a communist state. And there's, there's a difference. I call it gas and water socialism. And we still sort of have that, but there's one gas company, and it's also called monopoly in some people's view, but that gas and water is still one provider in the United States. And uh, I call that in China gas and water socialism that they have. So does Scandinavia. <coughs> Sewer socialism is called another Milwaukee nickname. All, they, had they had a socialist mayor in Milwaukee and he called his platform Sewer Socialism. A uh, variety of heavy pollutants due to steel coal burning. I'm proud to say ComEd has stopped coal burning, at least in Pilsen. Open burning in yards and high production of plastics. So, high production is their creed, low prevention is looking the other way in the case of China. Uh, island landfills. Hey, guess what? South China Sea has new land. Did we discover it? No, it was fabricated through landfills. Is it a military strategy or a way to give thousands and millions of people a place to go for vacation? Well, I see it's at the same time as a vacation spot, a, a handy place to park fighter jets. And they're in the South China Sea. Other problems. Belt and Road, 30 
billion dollars a year. That's money that's not going into the Chinese domestic economy. It's going into production of Belt and Road in places like Pakistan, East Africa. It's a very expensive undertaking, as the Alliance of Progress was for John Kennedy, as the Marshall Plan was after World War II. But it was all about helping the rest of the world recover. And I think that the main part of it, that Belt and Road is about humanitarian concerns. They're not building them in Europe, they're building them in developing countries, 70 of them. But some may say, waste of money? I think Trump would. He sure wouldn't build belts and roads in developing nations unless it was to his interest. Uh, high automobile consumption. Yeah, it's very fashionable to have an automobile now if you're middle class, but I think that's going to hit the fan in the next five to ten years as cities become very, very crowded. The density problem. So there goes that visa to live in the city again. You've got to be mindful of what's coming as more country folk move to the city. Um, Mr. Trump says China is not a fair trader. That the states manage products and industries, the state in China, and that key sectors of the economy not, yeah, right. steals yeah, trade secrets. He said that CTE phone company was stealing trade secrets from American AT&T. That's his, that's his alibi for the high tariffs. Uh, mostly heavy industries China is doing well in. Steel, aluminum, agricultural implements. But they have yet to outfox the US or Europe in big pharmacy concerns. Hoge, uh, Merck, uh, oh you can name so many, uh, Pfizer. They have yet to make their own automobile, if that even matters anymore. It is a status item. They don't brand their own computers. I don't see many. But they're big producers of parts, semiconductors, dram chips, for the computers we make, for the computers South Korea makes, for the computers Japan makes. You can operate and make all those parts yourself. You can't operate and fabricate all those parts yourself. So guess who gets it? North Korea gets the business in fabricating the pieces that Japan, uh, US, and China make. So they're gaining, they're gaining ground. I think I could uh, stop there. No one talked about here linking up cities or a belt to, say, Milwaukee. I thought someone might say, how about a belt and road to Kenosha? How about a belt and road? I think we have metro to Kenosha, right. But to Racine, to Geneva, we don't have that yet. All right, let's go to questions now. Let's go to questions, because I've sure rolled out lots of problems. Okay. Go ahead, fire away. Uh, Peter, in your uh, trip to China, did you ever encounter any uh, what what was the biggest thing that the Americans do right and the Chinese do wrong? Mm. I think to be in disguise as a capitalist, uh, China may may be fooling themselves uh, that there is a lot of state control, failure or success in an experimental industry. But who takes a hit, the taxpayer and the state government? Their wage taxes, or let's say their withholding. I think the U.S. kids themselves at being socialistic in that we're not always uh, socialistic. But is that your, not very socialist at all. Is that your question, or did you say, what do we do right? Uh, I was just asking, what do we do right and China does wrong? Well, I... Uh, China Wants to Be More Like Us is a book title I, I've seen, More Like Us. And the U.S., at least under um, Bernie Sanders, wants to go through social, socially uh, acceptable and socially helpful programs. But can you win? Can anyone win the White House anymore with socially advanced and progressive ideas? Someone said Miss Warren could tonight. 
But who else has questions? Come on, we gotta, we gotta. All right, over here, please. Yeah, let's have one. Stand up and. Uh, oh. Yeah, I had one question. I'm a Coke drinker. I love uh, Coca-Cola. Oh. What did the label say on that can? The hazards of. Uh, Where did it go? Thank you. Thank you. Just curious. No, I could not read the uh, Mandarin on that. Oh. But they have put some. Looks like a deposit on here. A deposit for the can. I would believe that I'm trying to sweeping the streets, picking up cans. Okay, but the, was there a confirmed uh, notation of, a, of any type of hazard? I don't. About the drink? I, no, I don't. I don't see it. Would you like to take a look? Maybe you could click uh, click on Google. Uh, okay. It's the real thing. That's it, David. It's the real thing. All right. Let's go. Right. Yeah. You brought up. Uh, Quite read Mandarin. How much Mandarin do you know, and how much can you read, and could you communicate with the other Chinese? Uh, that's more Japanese, though. That's oh. Japanese. I I lived in Japan for three years, and in teaching there at the junior college, I picked up quite a bit of Japanese in order to converse with the students. But no Chinese. That's why I took the group tour. That's why I took the group tour. Travis. Uh, yeah. Um, several decades ago, when they were first, uh, I think when Nixon had first opened trade in the 70s. With China, uh, Coca Cola had a slogan that Coke adds life. Coke adds life? Coke Nobody liked it? Coke adds life. And, you mean uh, that kind? Coke I adds life. I hear you. What's wrong with it? And uh, there was a big hail of blue in China because there was a misinterpretation that said Coke brings your ancestors back from the dead. Oh. <laughs> well. Uh, adds life. You know, they interpreted ads as bringing you back. They had to change that label quickly. Yeah, okay. All right. You were under the... I think I heard you say that the Chinese don't make computers and the Chinese don't make cars. Can you name one? I may be remiss. You certainly are. A label? Not because Mitsubishi Le anymore. Lenovo is a very huge computer manufacturer. <laughs> Lenovo. And they make, they bought the business from IBM and started their own. And they're huge. And they're a Chinese company. And as far as cars, China has a wonderful car business industry that uh, doesn't require GM and Ford and uh, whatever. I mean, actually, the company that owns Saab now and bought it from Ford is a Chinese com auto company. I think so, Mittal owns it, uh, Indian Corporation no, owns it does not. Volvo, Volvo no. for sure, Jaguar for sure. They own yeah. Jaguar, Tata Motors owns, Tata. owns Jaguar. Mittal is But Steel. Saab, no, Saab is owned by, the Chinese have a wonderful car company and they have a wonderful consumer computer company. Very large. If it's so wonderful, why don't we see one here? Because you're not looking. I'm not looking. Oh, you're Anyone looking name a household well. automobile from China that's on the streets? They sell yes, sir. Uh, China has taken over Tata? MG Rover. Yeah, taking over is one thing. The car's already built, sir. The machine, it's already machined. Taking over versus starting up. Mitsubishi couldn't even do it in downstate Illinois. They have cars in China. Quite a feat. There, there is a driving automotive industry. It's just that they, they can build them cheaper in China because they don't have the EPA controls like we do here in the U.S. on uh, some EPA, of their cars. That's another problem, yeah. Um, yes? Yes, sir. You alluded to it uh, very briefly, uh, but uh, the uh, artificial islands being built by... Yeah, the uh, landfill. Right. Uh, they all seem to be, at least on some of the maps I've seen, they all seem to be moving toward Formosa. 
uh, what used to be nationalist China. Mm -hmm. Does uh, China have uh, lustful designs on uh, uh, Formosa? The U.S. State Department likes to think under Trump anyway that there are designs toward launches to Taiwan and uh, that that's why the islands are built in the South China Sea uh, I think it's um, a design to be ready in all cases uh, for combat with Japan, for possible combat for with South Korea. And those islands in the stream, they remind me of, you know, it's Hemingway, but um, if, you, if you're a resident of those islands or you move on to one of those islands, do you get a visa? Makes me wonder if you get a Chinese visa. If anyone's looking for a second visa, and I am be, uh, when the next election comes, I'd love How hard to, is it yeah. to get a visa? How hard is it? I, I got the visa in two weeks. I had to stand in line down on Michigan Avenue to get the visa. Okay, you got another question over here. I have papers. Yes. Who makes the robots? The robots, China's ahead, but um, I mean, they're advancing, but I don't know if they're the leading robot producer. It may be South Korea. It may be Japan. I don't feel the U.S. is. If they want to be like us, do they have the opiate uh, vaping problem? The opiate problem? They had when China was a colony, of course. We know opiate policy was a British uh, policy of dominance. But no, I don't, I don't think there's that. The misery factor is lower in China. Let me put it that way. The misery factor is lower. You've got 56 languages spoken, and yet somehow they mostly get along. I know you're going to raise the Uyghur issue that those country people are discriminated against. For the most part, 56 native, uh, 56 language speakers, and they're all getting along, not discriminating in job hiring and that sort of thing. I think that gives you less reason to do coke or opiates. But they want to drink coke. Oh, but they want to drink Coke. Yeah, our cigarettes and our Coke is big consumption. Big consumption. Should we be ashamed of that or export like hell? Wasn't that Hong Kong? That's an open question. Wasn't that Hong Kong recently where the police were um, used really powerful force? Thanks. Nobody brought up Hong Kong yet, and that's the embarrassment. And that's why there's so much government spending on local surveillance. China is very, very embarrassed about that. And uh, especially during this time of um, tariffs, what tariffs are? You're being unfair in the U.S. Well, the Hong Kongers are saying you're being unfair okay. to us with extradition. Yes. Yeah, um, did you have the opportunity at all to talk to average Chinese or anyway educated Chinese uh, freely? And what do they think about, for example, the tariffs? What do they think about Donald Trump? Well, what do they think about Tiananmen Square? Do you have a chance to talk about any of those to, to average Chinese? The average person didn't want to talk about politics, but did want to talk about movies, uh -huh. food, fashion. Uh, although I wasn't talking to high-ranking people, I got to talk to the guide in the restaurant, have lunch together, so she face-to-face -face was willing to talk quite a bit. I got to talk to a college professor of science makes uh, artificial limbs, uh, designs them. And guess where he got his degree? UIC. I, I felt we contributed something to humanity with that. And I had his address because he was um, living near me at uh, Little Italy. And uh, I got to meet him at a coffee house in Little Italy. That's where I live, near UIC. Yes, sir. I like your red T-shirt. Yeah. In 1976, I spent three weeks in China. And it was a very poor country. Before I ask wow, my six. question. 76? Yeah. Summer of 76. I was 20 years old. And one of the jokes we made about smoking was in the restaurants, we had two sections, smoking and chain smoking. <laughs> but the question I have, obviously back then there weren't billionaires. You have a billionaire class in China. I sincerely believe when I was in China, it was a socialist country. Uh, to me, it's like an oxymoron. Maybe I'm wrong. 
to have a billionaire class and call yourself a socialist country. I mean, this is what I would say to Tim's question. They're confused about who they are, and maybe Bernie Sanders is a little confused about what he can get accomplished in this country that's baseline capitalist. But yeah, you're right. Uh, okay. 76 was a rough time to go. But, uh, How'd you get a visa? You talk about the 99% here and the 1% here. I think it's What's even worse than China. Oh, yeah. we got to get back to questions. Yes. Okay. What on his side? Yeah, you, uh, at one point, uh, his you people. said that uh, they don't call themselves uh, communists anymore. They, they call themselves socialists. They never were communists. There never was a communist country, quote unquote. They were only socialists. They were only kept uh, communists in name only. Well, if you look at some of the countries they did support, you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, and such, there was an alliance of communists who were in agreement at that time. They were using the term communists loosely, uh, they, but none of them accomplished the nirvana state of Communist. Uh, if you if you read the Communist Manifesto, that's really a Nirvana state. It's a perfect state, and nobody has achieved that. No one has achieved that. That's why I favor socialism, as Bernie views it. Uh, it's achievable and was achievable, and it still is in Scandinavia, Denmark, Holland. Uh, these places um, thrive and under socialism. Socialist Party of Sweden still exists. Yes. Communism is an aspiration. Huh, I like that. Okay. Something to shoot for instead of a gross national product. Yeah, but now lately it's productivity okay. figures that are yeah. the rage. Yeah. Who else? Socialism uh, is, the dem is when the uh, sort of economy yeah. is democratically sort run by the people. Since most of those countries calling themselves socialists are not democratic, they're not socialism. Right, there said, are aspects of socialism in the United States. <coughs> uh, public schools, public... Uh, Gas and water, uh, right, as you say. Right. Uh, there are aspects stop. of socialism in the countries calling them socialists, okay. calling themselves socialists, like yeah. Cuba. I've got to stop you, though, Cuba. because but, you had one question already. Yeah, but, but social... How do you differentiate between socialism and communism? Communist was a party and still is. Socialist is a way of life to me. That's how I... Brush. Did you see men and women working? It's like, like America or how... I didn't get into a factory. I wish I could have. factory, but like a downtown, you know. Well, there were people hand sweeping the sidewalks, even downtown Shanghai. Really, really orderly. Did you not, did you not, did you not say that as many men, women, as many women? No segregation in that regard. That's another advancement that the Soviet Union and China accomplished early on. Is equal equal production, equal work, and equal pay in. China and the Soviet Union. So that is an achievement. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'd like to try. If there's no more questions, I'd like to now move on to rebuttals, if possible. Let's. Uh, oh. Unless uh, somebody else has a burning question. In back, let's the last question. Burning question. I can't smell it. No. All right. Stand up and let's hear from you. Yeah, I was wondering if people, if there's not a whole lot of car ownership, is more of the people get around than by like mopeds and motor scooters? Motor scooters. I haven't seen these scooters. I did not see the scooters that, well, I did. And people were complaining about them. I said, what are you complaining about? They said uh, to the guy, these damn scooters that are piling up on the sidewalk. I should have known then that they were coming. I mean, this is about a year ago, and they're saying these damn scooters, they just pile up and trip people. They weren't, they weren't thrilled about those scooters. I mean, the little ones that you yeah, got a battery in now. Yeah, but they own motor scooter, you know, that's fine. Yeah, the Honda Yamaha kind of scooters. That's right. for delivering soup and delivering, yeah, hot soup to a skyscraper. And personal transportation. Yes. 
Yeah, you know, the car is still rare in the, in the family setup. Yeah. Train, why? When you got great trains and buses, really, why bother well, with the car? Well, I just figure you don't have a lot of cars, there'd be more people, you know, many small motorcycles. On bikes. On bikes. I'll bet in 76 more, you saw lots of bikes. There's actually been more bikes interstate... And bus, and buses. Yeah. There's actually, he said you're paying. There's actually been more miles of interstate highway built in the last 10 years in China that it now exceeds our interstate system. Car ownership's gone up quite a bit in China. Yeah. They'll be sorry. Well, you know, the thing is, is that uh, they're already having heavy problems with traffic congestion, and there's a movement of foot right now for pollution controls in an EPA yes. organization like there's been oh, yeah. in the U.S. Like the EPA operate in China. Yeah. Oh, they, they will. They there's got some. There's some control. Okay. Over coal burning. Any other control. questions? All right, let's go to rebuttals. Let's thank Peter Perro for his presentation. All right. How many? Uh, Andy, could you facilitate the rebuttals, please? Thank you, honey. Andy Anderson. And come on up and let's... Uh, Let's let Andy get a count, and then we'll do a little time on it. So, Andy, can you go on up, please? Again, Peter, thank you very much thank for a everyone. wonderful presentation. Make sure you keep everything ready for the reserves. Andy, are you ready to get a count on the rebuttals and uh, the time in there? Yeah, everybody raise their hand. Let's get a count. Who wants to give a rebuttal? Sure. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. About three minutes apiece. Three minutes or yeah. four? No, four we run way over on the time. Okay, three minutes apiece. I'm going to do the first rebuttal. Oh, Adam Smith is coming. <laughs> I sense it. In first A couple of things you might want to know about China. And what, what they're doing, is particularly in the nuclear power industry. As of, as of right now, with what I learned from the Thorium Energy Alliance conference that it was recently at, they are one of the biggest innovators of the use of the molten salt thorium reactor. As of right now, the present nuclear industry in China is about 10 years ahead of us in its widespread deployment, and they're probably going to have the first commercially viable reactor come out. Who's helping them out? Our Department of Energy. The way they're probably going to deploy these things around the world is they're basically going to give them away to countries. They'll, they'll, what they'll wind up doing is they'll actually give you the reactor and charge you a royalty fee on the amount of electricity that you make. And right now, a lot of our capitalism in America is uh, basically eating, giving China our seed corn, in a sense, with our proprietary information and all this, because of their government subsidized cheap labor and if we in America don't wake up to the fact that uh, we're going to have we're going to be facing some serious competition with their government subsidies we got another thing coming basically uh, China is on the rise basically because of the usage of American principles that we did in the late 19th and early 20th centuries they're liberalizing their markets they're uh, using a lot of state control but they haven't given up what is, as Stalin would say, the commanding heights of the economy. They've been able to boom because of market liberalization, but they have not advanced in the freedom aspect of it yet. I happen to know and have been blessed to work with a lot of Chinese immigrants over the summer through a Toastmasters group out in Lake Zurich called the Sunday Speakers. What a lot of the immigrants here in America do is they send their kids when they're off school or on the weekends to these Chinese American schools. They, you, you know, like for example, the one out that I'm familiar with in Lake Zurich, they have almost uh, maybe a thousand kids and their parents come in on a Saturday or Sunday morning for additional instruction from the American deals. And I'll tell you, a lot of these first generation parental immigrants are very happy because of the rights and the political freedom they have here. They said that it's not existed in China right now and you could not speak out. And they do have a lot of internal surveillance. But one thing that struck me about what meeting these people who are, have immigrated to our country and their children is how industrious they are, how conservative in their values they are, how somewhat reluctantly they are ready to speak about politics. But you know, 
China has done this before. They've had well over 4,000 years of their administrative civil service type of government, their Confucianism, and uh, aside from what may have happened in the Mao, which is a dictatorship and an anomaly, they probably are going to take our principles, they're probably going to rise, and they're probably going to be the next dominant country in the next century. Thank you. Hello, I'm Linda Merrick, advocate for people with disabilities at Power Center for Independent Living. And I want to say that somebody mentioned about the people being corralled into a community. Is it going to be like a <coughs> reservation where people are not take, properly taken care of? Or worse yet, concentration camps. <laughs> Who mentioned that? He, he meant a, a kibbutz, like in Israel. It, he didn't mean a concentration camp or uh, it, it's more like a village. Village. Like a kibbutz. Excuse me, you if I could explain. Yes. When Israel was faced with with hundreds of thousands of people coming there, they needed to do something about them. So Israel built cities, and they built what they called a kibbutz. That means a city in Hebrew. And they would take and put in an olive processing plant, a citrus processing plant, etc. And they'd bring in a bunch of people in there, and they'd tell them, we're going to give you housing we're going to give you uh, a certain pay. We're going to give you food so long as you stay on the kibbutz. Okay. After about four or five years, they'd say, we now know the language. We've saved money, and we want to move. So they then would move and leave the kibbutz, and new people okay. would come uh, on the kibbutz. Like a transitional program. What's that? Like a transitional program. There you go. Well, when I was a little girl, my dad told me that Chinese people, when there was a baby, uh, girl baby born, they would drown it in a bucket. And when he was an executive, and he wore white uh, shirts all the time, so he would go to the Chinese uh, shop where he would get his laundry done. Nice and white and clean and everything. One day, he didn't have a little ticket for his uh, shirts to get returned, and the Chinaman said, "No ticky, no shorty." I thought you were going to say Colonel Sanders was there. No. <laughs> so what what happens is also little shops where you could go get your laundry done, but they still have the uh, Chinese. Um, Restaurants, and I appreciate that. Hi, folks. Okay. Hi. My name is Raj Patel. I remember. Uh, in India, and China and India were at the same level, basically, everybody was poor. And uh, in all these years, what China has accomplished, I think they need a congratulations, it's extraordinary achievement. We are not able to achieve as much here for our poor people, for our discriminated people, and China has accomplished a lot. Now, of course, no two countries progress in the same way. Every country has their pluses and their minuses, some good and some bad. When we started in a 300 years back, our intellectual property was all stolen. They all stolen from Europe. We did not have a research. We did not have a... Uh, industry, they all came from Europe, and some chief executive used to go there and to steal, steal the secrets. 
So I mean, uh, countries who have a knowledge like this, people who have a knowledge, ultimately is going to go to people who don't, do not have a knowledge. It's the, that, that knowledge you cannot imprison it. You cannot hide it. You cannot put it in a box and say, hey, sooner or later it's going to go. We are learning not from other people, other people are learning not from us. So it is going to stay. And uh, look, what, what country had done as much as China had done in terms of, if China, let me tell you this way, if uh, China do not make small, small products, we will suffer. Because almost everything you see in your house, small, small products, go to dollar store, you go to, uh, go to clothing store, is from China. You go, to, you go to buy a stream, it is from China. I mean, uh, without, without their thing, American middle class would not have come up in America. Because our things were very, very expensive. You know, lots of people had a very sparse furniture and thing in their home. And China and Taiwan and Korea, they made it possible for us to live a life that we could not have lived. And this is reality. And, and uh, look, Japan, Japan had changed a lot. They are not making those, those plastic things and slip sneakers and all those things. And no, not, not quality, they were quality product now. Okay, we made a mistake in that we did not learn how to make our own brooms and buckets and you know things like that. You know, we did not learn that in America. We we gave it away. And who gave it away? Our corporations. Our corporation gave it away. How? They see a quick profit making making goods in China and Taiwan and Korea and uh, everywhere. They made a quick box. And they made a quick box. And that is why, whatever problem you think we have, we have those countries in, in a balance. And look, look what kind of democracy we are talking about. What Trump is doing. You gotta wrap it up, Raj. Okay. What Trump is doing is that he, we don't have to, he decides. Congress even do not have a right right now. Thank you. All right. Okay, China. There's an awful lot to say about China. One thing is that Chinese and us and the Europeans, we're all the same. Um, everybody dresses the same. The ladies wear shorts, pants, skirts. The guys do their thing. It's all the same. We eat the same snacks. It's, it's just the same. Everybody's a consumer. We're all consumers. It's just the same. Um, I read a story the other day about uh, New Zealand. New Zealand, little city in New Zealand had a um, empty factory. They, no one local could think of what to do, invest. And they asked some Chinese company, can you guys figure out what to do here? They gave us some fun. They came over and they said, yes, we need bottled water in China. So what we're going to do is drill into the aquifer, pump some water out, bottle it, and ship it to China. And we'll sell it there. And it just started me thinking. It's like China has about 400 million people that live at the level of the United States. They have another 900 million that don't. Okay? I really think that we are not looking around the corner when we look into the future. That's right. I think that the future is not going to be anything like the past. I think this Greta Gert, what's the fun Thurnberg? Yeah. Is right. That the end of the world as we know it is what's around the corner. And just think of, all right, 300 million Chinese are living as we do now. Another 900 million sit in the wings. How many bottles of water do they need delivered? How many Walmarts? How many Kentucky Fried Chickens? How much infrastructure do they need to support another 900 million Chinese? Okay, okay? and it could, you could make the same argument for Indians. Okay, it's just not going to happen. It's not there. We don't have a planet big enough for it. Okay. Um, the other thing about China is. 
They make an awful lot of computers. They make an awful lot of cars. It's domestic, okay? All their cars are domestic. They don't export, but they're very talented, okay? Ford couldn't do anything with Volvo, and they did. They turned wonderful, you know, wonderful people. Um, the last thing about China is they share a common hydroglyph language, okay? Hydroglyphs, like the Egyptians. Every, they write picture writing. They've also translated all that sounds into like an alphabet like we do, and they're going to try to move to that. But within the hieroglyph language, which is very popular and used now, within China there are five dialects, five strong dialects. They cannot understand each other. These are not dialects. These are separate languages. Okay? But they all use the same glyph. All right? Saying you speak Chinese is like saying you speak European. It's like meaningless. All right. Good evening. Uh, I'm David Tripp. I, uh, I want to say that, in my opinion, the Chinese people are extremely pragmatic. They do, right or wrong, they do whatever works now. And there's something to be said for that. Uh, when Chinese were first coming to the United States, we were, uh, like a lot of other people, they worked for the railroad, like Italians and Irish and so forth. Chinese worked for the railroad, building, laying tracks and so forth. And the Chinese, uh, there was a joke. They used to say that they would put, they would have so many Chinese uh, put in uh, drill holes and put in dynamite in a mountain when they were making tunnels. And when the dynamite went off and um, uh, 20 or 30 Chinese got blown to smithereens, uh, they would say, well, now all we have to do is get another 20 or 30 Chinamen. Uh, well, the Chinese pretty quickly realized that that wasn't working out for them. So they started setting up restaurants and feeding people, and they saw that they could make a good living from feeding the railroad workers and other such people as they quit working for the railroad. They also set up laundries. People needed to have clean clothes. The Chinese provided that. So they did what was pragmatic and what was good for the Chinese, and it was also good for everyone else. Uh, I believe that ultimately the Chinese will go more and more capitalistic because it works. Uh, it, it worked for the United States uh, since the Soviet Union, who was the great leader of communism, collapsed. Uh, they've gone this capitalist route. And um, China is also now in the throes of going the capitalist route. Little by little, they keep going more and more free market. So. Uh, I can see, the, in as much as the Chinese are a very pragmatic people, I can see a time coming when they may be more capitalistic than we are. Uh, that may sound funny now, but uh, uh, it, it might sound just as funny as when, when we said that uh, one day our former enemies would be building our appliances, and it seemed like a big joke. But today, they build our appliances. Uh, I take my hat off to the Chinese in as much as they do what works. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, and I want to say one other thing. I fail to see any real difference in socialism and communism. 
All right. Um, wanted to give you my uh, thoughts on China giving uh, two uh, illustrations. Uh, the first one is what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, there are a lot of people who, uh, a lot of Westerners who are really um, simpatico with the uh, people in Hong Kong who are fighting for freedom. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, their, uh, their, their beliefs are misplaced. Um, Hong Kong is not a British territory anymore, which means it doesn't have British laws or British ideas of human rights. It's Chinese. Now, we may not agree with the Chinese uh, approach to human rights, and that's another issue, but it is part of the territory of China now. And it, it's just crazy, I think, to tell China uh, how they should run this tiny little island. Um, it's, uh, it, I mean, I, my heart goes out to them, but people are forgetting the fact that, that England went in there and with a, holding a gun to their head forced China to sign a lease and basically hijacked that territory for 99 years. Nobody's talking about that. I mean, that must be immensely humiliating. Imagine if somebody came to this country, some country, and said, and held a, a bunch of warships and said, okay, we're going to lease New York City from you, and we're going to run it. <laughs> it's outrageous. Um, now, on the other hand, on the, opposite, the exact opposite end of the country, on the western end of the country, is a, a province called uh, uh, Xinjiang. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. And this isn't in the paper a lot. It, it's similar. It's a, a parallel to what's happening in Tibet, uh, but Xinjiang doesn't have a personality like the Dalai Lama to promote it. Right now, there are one million, not an exaggeration, a million people from that province, which is a predominantly Muslim, in concentration camps. Now, the Chinese call them voluntary education camps. No joke. This is in the news. And, um, and there's a huge outroar about this. It is a huge violation of human rights. Now, again, I, I don't think we should force ourselves into a country and tell them how they should run things. But I do think that we have the, a moral obligation to decide if we're going to, what our relationship is going to be like with countries that don't respect human rights. And we should adjust our relationship based on the, the, the level of human rights that they respect. So regardless of whether it's in Hong Kong or, or a province that most people haven't even heard of called Xinjiang, we should really consider whether we do business with China, how much we do business, how much money we borrow from them, which is like Insane. Yeah, I'm going to admit it. Uh, I am a little bit um, uncomfortable with the idea of uh, mainland China building artificial uh, land masses, moving in the direction of uh, Taiwan or Formosa, whatever way you want to call the islands. Uh, it disturbs me because I do feel that they're up to something. Be that as it may, we can hardly afford to ignore these people. We can hardly afford to pretend that they don't exist. And indeed, this is not a new fear Close to 200 years ago, someone, I think it may have been Napoleon, said, China is a sleeping giant. Beware when she awakens. She is awakening, ladies and gentlemen, and we are in a position where we can, if not tame the sleeping giant, we can learn to live with the sleeping giant. I would much rather have them trading with us than firing uh, uh, bombs at us and us at them. Very few wars are that productive. We do it very often because we can't think of anything else. Now, I am not a pacifist. 
I do believe that there are times when you have to be ready to defend yourself and your own. However, I think we'll all agree that there has in recent years been far too much reliance, reliance on uh, guns and planes and tanks. I have no objection to the use of any of them when they are necessary. I do think, however, that we have very often taken the easy way out. And I'm not alone. I have talked to retired officers. They have said the same thing. They're a little bit disgusted with our laziness in uh, moving toward war when war is not necessary. You know, we went for numerous generations in this country with relatively few wars. Now all of a sudden we've got a war a year. Uh, my daughter jokingly asked, Dad, what do you think is going to be, instead of the flavor of the month, the war of the month? This gets ridiculous. We can't continue, I mean, from our own, for our own good, we can't continue going down that path or we are going to be a bankrupt nation, morally as well as financially. So it is in our interest. Yes, China is, is, is gaining in many areas. We can, I believe, and my name is not Neville Chamberlain, I believe that we can work with them. I believe that they too would much rather trade with us than fight us. And I believe that every time we send people over to China to learn a little bit more about their country, and every time they send people over here to learn a little bit more about us, although I draw the line that they're learning too much about our secrets, uh, the fact of the matter is we've got to take a common sense view here. We may not trust these people, but let's face it folks, they don't trust us. <laughs> Remember, the Brits were the big, and, and someone else said it, the Brits were the biggest dope pushers uh, in the world 150 years ago. I hate to say it, but Queen Victoria grew rich as a dope pusher. Yep. Right. And uh, again, uh, that's not because this is an Irishman saying it. It is because of the fact that it is a fact that I think everybody in this room knows about. And I have just received, uh, I believe, the red light. Brexit. <laughs> Brexit. Thank you. Brexit. All right. There you go. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, I'm entrusted to time myself while Andy goes to the bathroom, so you people could be hearing a lot from me. Well, you'll be, I'll be, ba up. I'll be backing you, up, backing <laughs> him up. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, a few points. I agree with Ed Rio, so you could talk for hours and hours on all kinds of issues having to do with China. Uh, regarding communism, socialism, and capitalism, yes, there is a difference between communism and socialism. <laughs> communism means that everybody essentially has the same thing. Uh, there's never really perhaps been a purely communist state, but uh, it's, uh, it's not only common ownership uh, of productive resources, but common ownership of everything. Socialism is common, ocean, uh, common ownership of productive facilities such as factories and hotels and restaurants and so on and so forth. And capitalism is our system where there's much private ownership. Thing is, there are very few countries in the world that are purely communist, purely socialist, or purely capitalist. We're all a blend, uh, including here in the United States, we're partially socialist with uh, roads, fire departments, police departments, schools, etc. And I, I enjoy getting into arguments with my conservative friends, and we'll talk about something, and they'll say, well, you're nothing but a socialist. And I'll say to them, that's true in part, but so are you. And then the argument would go on about, you know, schools, libraries, etc., etc. Um, another thing, uh, regarding the one-child policy, I think that uh, China had it right. Of course, there's a lot of talk now about saving the planet, about uh, uh, the uh, environmental crisis and so on and so forth. The one solution that I hear, don't hear people talking about very much 
is the is the most important solution of all, and that is uh, reducing population somehow or another. Uh, it's very very difficult to do politically and socially, but we have to do it at some point. It will be done. It'll either be Mother Nature with disease, you do want uh, GDP or, or, or we'll do it here. through some kind of organized uh, <laughs> method. China tried. I, I'm very sorry that they failed. Uh, as far as people being educated here from China, uh, I don't know what the statistics are offhand, but I have a little anecdotal evidence. Some maybe 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Maybe 30 years ago, I graduated from the uh, University of Chicago Graduate School of Business, and at that time, I don't remember having a single Asian classmate. I probably did, but I just don't remember. There were very few. Now you go down to campus, you go there for a lecture or something, and it seems like half the students there are Asian females. So that that part has changed. Um, and they say that the tariffs are hurting China more than they're hurting us. But I think the Chinese can probably hold out longer because the government is going to tell them that they're going to hold out. And they haven't had all the luxuries we've had anyway. So this could be a very interesting battle. Thank you. All right, next. No, I don't either. You know how to turn it off? <laughs> all right, with regard to Xinjiang promise, if that's how it's pronounced. Um, as I recall, that's where the big Chinese rocket base is, and where they are uh, frequently, that's where they're, they're all the Chinese astronauts take off from. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I realize I've told this joke to this group before. And then uh, we heard a lot of talk earlier about how China is not a self conscious country anymore, it's a socialist one, and it's in some ways really a capitalist one. Well, I will say this. That at one point there was a conference in Moscow, and that was still under communist rule. And there was there was a meeting concerning the nature of uh, there was a going on concerning communist excuse me, ideology. And somebody stood up and said, Comrade Chairman, what is the difference between capitalism and communism? And the chairman said, well, comrade, I'm glad you asked that question. It's a very important question, a very good question. And the answer simply is this. Under capitalism, man exploits man. Under communism, it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> man exploits man. All right, any other rebutters? Yeah. All right, Charlie. All right, let's say Peter. Very nice presentation. I'll be very quick. I just want to correct one complete misconception that I heard earlier tonight regarding the Chinese and the Transcontinental Railroad. There are two railroads, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific. The uh, Union Pacific began out of Omaha uh, and used uh, Irish. Uh, Irish Civil War veterans, and they did a commendable job. And they were used to military activities and the construction of the very orderly process of a railroad they took to and did in a magnificent fashion. On the other coast, uh, out of Sacramento, the Central Pacific, uh, there was a gold rush and a silver rush in progress. They attempted recruiting among uh, the indigenous population, and they had no success or limited success. They were, in fact, building the railroad. Uh, they said, at the time, I don't have the figures, there were as many as 60,000 Chinese living in the state of California. They said, let's, let's employ these Chinese. Uh, they built the walls, so there should be no issue for them. Uh, they undertook the task with equal, uh, there's no such thing about they're being killed in excessive numbers, uh, any more so than any other laborer on the railroad. It's a dangerous occupation. We're quitting. They uh, use black powder uh, and in, in a limited extent nitroglycerin, which I could go into. They did not, they cooked their own meals and had their own chefs. Uh, 
and they didn't run restaurants. This is a stereotype that I'm sorry is not the case in laundries. Uh, there is some debate, and this was came in with the 150th anniversary. There was it was long thought that all of them had returned to China after they had they had conscripted laborers in China, in mainland China itself, and that they had returned there. And there was some historical local activity to ascertain if they could find any that had remained in the United States and conceivably took occupations on other railroads or even discovered some that may have been working as far away as the islands of Cuba. But I haven't kept up with that project, I don't know to what extent, but they didn't get blown up 20 at a time and things like that. As a matter of fact, I actually came across one thing that it was an error that they were, it was a very difficult passage through the mountains, the Sierra Mountains, uh -huh. and it has given the name of the Chinese Pass, when in fact it was discovered it was done by Irishmen like this guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they deserve credit for it. All right, Andy. A couple of quick observations. Uh, mark it on your calendar. Uh, Seven months from now, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. By the end of May next year, you should be hearing more and more about countries mobilizing to do something about the climate catastrophe that is happening now all over the world. Fires, floods, these thousand year floods are happening to various places every year now. Even if the sea level doesn't come up, you know, Miami, uh, parts of it may be underwater, just flooded out every year or starting next year. Same thing with uh, areas of Houston, getting four feet of water in these hurricanes. That's climate change happening now, and the media is not talking about it. We're seeing all kinds of effects of what the scientists in Exxon Mobil have known for 40 years. The kids are the wild card. They're not talking about any particular political party. They're non-political. They're just uh, out there every Friday in growing millions all over the world, 150 countries involved, protesting for their future. And it's getting larger every week. For those of you that might have been fans of Jane Fonda, she started a new group uh, I just heard about it today. I don't even know. She's going to be sitting out on the Capitol steps every Friday for the next four or five months to start a group of celebrities. She just got so, arrested. People are, arrested. Yeah, I think she might have got arrested. But see, that's they're realizing the only way you can get movement in America is to do something to get arrested. If you just peacefully protest, the billionaire predators don't care how many people die. We have to cut into the profits. And that's, uh, China is also uh, beginning to move forward on that. But what we, I didn't hear mentioned tonight, but uh, China is building electric cars for like six to $8,000 a piece. They're putting up more solar panels than almost any other planet, you know, country on the planet. And it's, it's a worldwide revolution towards energy efficiency, solar, wind power, and uh, we should have an update. I'd like to have Tim schedule a debate between me and the Thorium Alliance sometime in the next six months. All right, if you're, say, you're uh, on. You know, I'll collect information you're for on. solar and wind power. You collect information for the Thorium. And let's, I may let's get John Kutch here himself. Comes. Yeah, tell him to come here. We'll, we'll have a good debate. OK, uh, our speaker will give All an update right. here, uh, Tim. wrap it up. Who's going to bring the potato chips? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what? No, 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 David Travis. Give our speaker one last hand. Thank you. So, so he's going to energize for his final comment. All right, Thank you for Peter. staying. I'm going to be very brief. Thanks for staying. Yeah, I, someone said, you got to keep ahead of this story. Someone said, you got to watch and keep ahead. Don't fall asleep here. Watch Asia. Uh, what did Obama call it? Pivot to Asia. He spent a lot more time mm -hmm. as a president in Asia. Pivot to Asia. Basketball move, I guess. Um, I just tried to keep up with it by uh, going in 1993. And now in 2019, uh, in seeing the huge change and uh, uh, amazing social, political, economic change, 
I think China is a country to watch because in 26 more years, uh, if I'm alive, I'll go back and see what has happened. And uh, if the past is any indication, then China is a nation to watch. Thank you for listening. One. All right. couple of resources for you guys to check out. If you really want to learn about China, just go to China, just Google China Central TV, English, and you'll be able to get their news broadcast. It is interesting. And again, we are adjourned. Have a good night, everybody, and thank you for attending. Hello, college regulars. Sir. Please move to the back as soon as you can to let the bus boys clean you. Thank you.